Good morning, CBC family. It is very good to be here with you today on this beautiful day. We're going to read together 1 Corinthians 9 through 12 in the new, back to the New Living Translation today. So these should be some very familiar verses. Uh, before, of course, we come to our word, though, let's just take a big deep breath. Let's just be mindful of the fact that we are indeed in the presence of the Holy One of Israel, who is also our Father, our loving and good Father. Am I not as free as anyone else? Am I not an apostle? Haven't I seen Jesus our Lord with my own eyes? Isn't it because of my work that you belong to the Lord? Even if others think I am not an apostle, I certainly am to you. You yourselves are proof that I am the Lord's apostle. This is my answer to those who question my authority. Don't we have the right to live in your home and share your meals? Don't we have the right to bring a believing wife with us, as the other apostles and the Lord's brothers do, and as Peter does? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have to work to support ourselves? What soldier has to pay his own expenses? What farmer plants a vineyard and doesn't have the right to eat some of its fruit? What shepherd cares for a flock of sheep and isn't allowed to drink some of the milk? Am I expressing merely a human opinion, or does the law say the same thing? For the law of Moses says, you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. Was God thinking only about oxen when he said this? Wasn't he actually speaking to us? Yes, it was written for us, so that the one who plows and the one who threshes the grain might both expect a share of the harvest. Since we have planted spiritual seed among you, Aren't we entitled to a harvest of physical food and drink? If you support others who preach to you, shouldn't we have an even greater right to be supported? But we have never used this right. We would rather put up with anything than be an obstacle to the good news about Christ. Don't you realize that those who work in the temple get their meals from the offerings brought to the temple? And those who serve at the altar get a share of the sacrificial offerings. In the same way, the Lord ordered that those who preach the good news should be supported by those who benefit from it. Yet I have never used any of these rights, and I am not writing this to suggest that I want to start now. In fact, I would rather die than lose my right to boast about preaching without charge. Yet preaching the good news is not something I can boast about. I am compelled by God to do it. How terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. If I were doing this on my own initiative, I would deserve payment, but I have no choice, for God has given me the sacred trust. What then is my pay? It is the opportunity to preach the good news without charging anyone. That's why I never demand my rights when I preach the good news. Even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. Even though I am not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessing. Don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, 
training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I might myself be disqualified. I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual water, for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. These things happened as a warning to us, so that we would not crave evil things as they did, or worship idols as some of them did. As scriptures say, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. And we must not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. Nor should we put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and then died from snake bites. And don't grumble, as some of them did, and then were destroyed by the angel of death. These things happened to them as an example for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, He will show you a way out so that you can endure. So, my dear friends, flee from the worship of idols. You are reasonable people. Decide for yourselves if what I'm saying is true. When we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. Think about the people of Israel. Weren't they united? by eating the sacrifices at the altar? What am I trying to say? Am I saying that food offered to idols has some significance or that idols are real gods? Not at all. I am saying that these sacrifices are offered to demons, not to gods. And I don't want you to participate with demons. You cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and from the cup of demons too. You cannot eat at the Lord's table and at the table of demons too. What? Do we dare to rouse the Lord's jealousy? Do you think we are stronger than he is? You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. So you may eat any meat that is sold in the marketplace without raising questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If someone who isn't a believer asks you home for dinner, accept the invitation if you want to. Eat whatever is offered to you without raising questions of conscience. But suppose someone tells you this meat was offered to an idol. Don't eat it out of consideration for the conscience of the one who told you. It might not be a matter of conscience for you, but it is for the other person. Why should my freedom be limited to what someone else thinks? If I can thank God for the food and enjoy it, why should I be condemned for eating it? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Don't give offense to the Jews or Gentiles or the Church of God. I too try to please everyone in everything I do. I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others so that many may be saved. And you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. I am so glad that you always keep me in your thoughts and that you are following the teachings I pass to you. But there is one thing I want you to know. The head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. The head of Christ is God. A man dishonors his head if he covers his head while praying or prophesying. But a woman dishonors her head if she prays or prophesies without covering her head for it is the same as shaving her head. If she refuses to wear a head covering, she should cut off her hair. But since it is shameful for a woman to have her hair cut or her head shaved, she should wear a covering. A man should not wear anything on his head when worshiping, for a man is made in God's image and reflects God's glory. And a woman reflects man's glory, 
For the first man didn't come from woman, but the first woman came from man. And man was not made for woman, but woman was made for man. For this reason, and because the angels are watching, a woman should wear a covering on her head to show she is under authority. But among the Lord's people, women are not independent of men, and men are not independent of women. For although the first woman came from man, every other man was born from a woman, and everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it right for a woman to pray to God in public without covering her head? Isn't it obvious that it's disgraceful for a man to have long hair? And isn't long hair a woman's pride and joy? For it has been given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to argue about this, I simply say that we have no other custom than this, and neither do God's other churches. But in the following instructions, I cannot praise you, for it sounds as if more harm than good is done when you meet together. First, I hear that there are divisions among you when you meet as a church, and to some extent I believe it. But of course there must be divisions among you so that you who have God's approval will be recognized. When you meet together, you are not really interested in the Lord's Supper, for some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. What? Don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet, when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So, my dear brothers and sisters, when you gather for the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. If you are really hungry, eat at home so you won't bring judgment upon yourselves when you meet together. I'll give you instructions about the other matters after I arrive. Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand this. You know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along in worshipping speechless idols. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another, and to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles, and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another Spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one Spirit, and we all share the same Spirit. 
Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not a part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can never say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members, so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is part of it. Here are some of the parts God has appointed for the church. First are apostles, second are prophets, third are teachers, then those who do miracles, those who have the gift of healing, those who can help others, those who have the gift of leadership, those who speak in unknown languages. Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? Of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the gifts that he pours out onto each one of us. Father God, help us to discern those spiritual gifts that are in us and help us to use them in ways that glorify your name and that show love for our neighbors, Father God. We just thank you for this, that we are the body of Christ, Father God, even in our separate places and our separate parts. We are still one body and one spirit, Father God. I just ask that you would help us lean into that idea today. And we pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, CPC family, uh, I hope you have found comfort in these words today um, and maybe some humor. Uh, I hope that you have a really good day, a good rest of your day, a great Sunday. I look forward to seeing you. I love you, and I will see you again tomorrow.